represents the growth of the Einstein-Rosen bridge in the boundary theory. So here I'm just uh, reviewing results from a nice paper by Schenker and Stanford, where they considered the case of a BTC black hole, so a black hole asymptotic to ADS3, um, whose Penrose diagram you can see in the first uh, picture. So a little experiment one can do here is to consider points in both boundaries labeled by a certain time, so let's take it to be the same in both boundaries, and we can construct the space-like geodesic that joins them. So the einstein rosen bridge, from this perspective, would be the length of that geodesic that happens to fall inside of the uh, black hole horizon. So, this so-called einstein rosen bridge has the property that it grows as time increases from the time equals to zero slice that is uh, known to be dual to the thermophile double state. Um, in particular, it grows polynomially at early times, and at late times, eventually, it grows uh, in the early time. Um, there's another interest, there's, there's an interesting property that this quantity has, which is, uh, goes under the name of the butterfly effect. So this is depicted in this second diagram. So here we consider a, some shell of matter in falling to the black hole that started at a certain time, Tw, in the past from one of the boundaries. And we will be considering always the, the extremal uh, uh, constant time slice that joins the t equals zero points in both boundaries. So what happens is that at early times, when this perturbation is thrown at times very close to t equals to zero, this doesn't really affect uh, the, uh, the, the, the t equals zero time slice. So the size of the, of the, of the wormhole is very small. But as, as we push this towards the past, um, at some point, at a time scale which is a order of the scrambling time of the black hole, proportional to the logarithm of the black hole entropy, this will eventually disrupt uh, the geometry and will cause the, uh, the wormhole to open up. Therefore, we will start to uh, see how the, the, the einstein rosen bridge grows. Right? So the profile is that initially there is an exponential growth, so very suppressed up to the scrambling time where it kicks up, and then at later times uh, it grows linearly. In particular, this computation was done by considering a null shock wave and then computing the back reactive geometry due to it. Um, so, sorry, yes. Here, like the two, the geodesic, the wormhole that you're drawing in this diagram is basically a connected. It's like the same piece coming on this connected on this both sides of the shock wave. The same. What do you mean by like this? In this diagram, it looks disconnected, right? But is yes. this the geodesic which is kind of connected across the shock wave? This, yeah, this is the extremal uh, okay. geodesic. It's the, it's the geodesic with shorter slides that you can construct. Okay. Yes. Um, th this geometry is just constructed by gluing two to, uh, pure BTC solutions with mass m and mass m plus the shock wave energy on the other side of the uh, null, null ray. Well, I think the question may be related to the fact that it looks discontinuous, but the reason that it's not is because it's the coordinates, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? I think so, yes. Yes. <clears throat> okay, so it was proposed that this quantity is going to be dual to complexity, as we have discussed, but there are two questions now. So the first is what complex complexity, and the second question is the complexity of what, right? So to address the first one, um, I can give some examples of complexity, uh, which we have already discussed. And so for instance, we can consider circuit complexity, um, which just measures, given a predefined set of unitary gates, the minimal number of gates that we need to go from a certain reference state to a target state whose complexity we want to measure. And the drawback of this notion of complexity is that it requires an extrinsic tolerance parameter, which tells us when we have to stop uh, by uh, when, when it comes to build the, the optimal quantum circuit that builds the, the, the target state. Uh, so this extrinsic tolerance parameter is there from the beginning in the definition of the complexity that we want to measure, and therefore it's not clear 
what is its holographic interpretation, what quantity in the bulk uh, plays the role of the tolerance parameter. So for holographic applications, this is always the problem that one needs to face. The alternative would be to consider size complexity, which um, is a definition of complexity suited to types of systems like spin chains or in type of quantum mechanical systems where the Hilbert space has a tensor product structure. And when we are considering some operator which consists of sums of strings where it's the identity on some sides and some non-trivial operator on another side, its size would be equal to the number of sides in that string where the operator is different from the identity. So this notion of complexity does not require an external tolerance parameter, and this is good, but it is bounded from above by a quantity that scales only linearly in system size because it cannot be bigger than the number of sites or degrees of freedom that your spin chain has. And uh, for instance, as we will discuss, we would like a notion of complexity that is bounded from above by a quantity that scales exponentially in system size, because this exponentially in entropy, because this is what would be uh, the size of the Hilbert space of, uh, of, of micro space, of micro, for example. So the second question is complexity of what? And by this, I mean complexity of states or of operators. So in the first of the two pictures that I showed earlier, we just had a, a pure BTC black hole, whose uh, einstein rosen bridge we were discussing. And there, one, would, one could make an argument that uh, the boundary quantity that captures that growth is just the complexity of the time evolution of the thermofield double state. Because at the time equals zero slice is dual to the thermofield double state. So the einstein rosen bridge should be somehow encoded in the evolution of this state. But more interestingly, in the case of the butterfly effect, where we had a back reactive geometry due to some impulsing shock wave, um, the, the, the state that should capture the, this, that should be dual to this, to this geometry in the boundary should be a thermofield double state with the insertion of some operator that generates this perturbation in the past. Uh, and therefore, so yes? Did you define the thermofield double state, by the way? I, I did not. It's just a maximally entangled state, uh, not max. It, it's it's. You it's provide it on the I can yes. I just, I just wanted to avoid too many clutter. Um, so so this is just. I don't know if this everyone is going to be able to see this. So the thermofield double state. It's, an, it's a state that is entangled between the two boundaries. It's not maximally entangled because it's weighted by some Boltzmann factor. Over two. So these are in the eigenstates, so en left plus en right. The sum normalization. And this is the state that's dual to the two-sided black hole uh, in, in ADS. So its evolution its evolution in time would give us the evolution of the Einstein-Rosen bridge, and its behavior when we insert an operator in the past would give us uh, the, the butterfly effect. So the change of complexity in that case would be essentially due to the complexity of this perturbation that we are inserting in the state. Uh, and this motivates us to study operator complexity rather than state complexity, um, because the phenomenology is going to be richer in terms of time scales. We're going to be able to probe the scrambling time, which is logarithmic in the system size. And eventually, we should also be able to probe the Heisenberg time, so exponential in, exponential in system size. So this is the time at which all the directions of the Hilbert space of the black hole have been extenuated. And then the microstate starts to explore linear recombinations of things that have already been explored. So complexity should saturate at these time scales. So by studying operator complexity, we should have access to both very early time scales and very late time scales of the black hole. And in particular now, I'm going to start defining uh, the particular case of Krilov complexity. This is a notion of complexity that is adapted by construction to the time evolution of an operator. Um, and for this, we need first to define the kinematical setup, which is uh, building Krilov space, basically. So we are considering a certain Hilbert space of states with d dimensions for a quantum mechanical system. And then operator space will just have dimension d squared. So in this operator space, we can consider the time evolution of an operator, which is generated by the Liouvillian uh, super operator, which is an operator over operator space. 
It consists just on the adjoint action of the Hamiltonian on operators. And then, just by observing the expression of the time evolution of the operator in the Heisenberg picture, we see that an arbitrary times, at an arbitrary time, uh, the, time of, the time evolves observable is just a linear combination of uh, nested commutators of the Hamiltonian with the operator. That is, consecutive powers of the Liouvillian acting on this operator. So this is just a linear combination of elements. And we can just consider the Hilbert space constructed by the span of all of them. And we call this Krylov space. So by definition, because it's contained in operator space, it's just the subspace of operator space. And by definition, it's the minimal subspace that contains the operator O of t at an arbitrary time. Um, because the operator space has a finite dimension, therefore, even though we are considering the span of an infinite number of elements, only a finite number of them should be linearly independent, should be linearly independent and there should be some finite dimension for this space, which we call k. So this is our Krylov space, space, and uh, its dimension is denoted by k. Now, we can find that dimension doing a simple computation. We just need a spectral decomposition of the operator in terms of the eigenstates of the Liouvillian itself. Um, so we can just construct, I'm using this smooth cat notation to denote uh, elements in operator space. And we can see that by taking ket bras of energy eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, we get states in operator space that are eigenstates of the Liouvillian, because when we act on the Liouvillian on them, it just outputs the corresponding energy difference or phase uh, to, this, uh, to, the, to the energy eigenstates that I used to, con to construct it. Um, so now by taking a spectral decomposition of the operator in terms of these Liouvillian eigenstates, we can see that some power of the Liouvillian acting on the operator only amplifies each direction by putting a power of the corresponding frequency. Uh, and therefore, uh, the projections of the operator on the different eigenstates of the Liouvillian don't get mixed when we apply powers of the Liouvillian on it, they just get amplified. And therefore, the Krylov space dimension is equal to the number of non-zero space eigenspace projections of the initial condition O. Now, this immediately get, gives an upper bound for the Krylov dimension, which is actually smaller than d squared, because as we see, the, the eigenvalues of the Liouvillian are energy differences, so whenever these two indices are the same, we just have identically an identically zero eigenvalue. So the zero phase is as I see at least d times degenerate. And therefore, because the contribution of the zero eigen eigenspace only contributes with one dimension, the real space, then we have an upper bound that is d squared minus d minus one. So d squared minus d plus one. We can make two comments from this bound. So the first bound is the, the first comment is that this is only sensible to the degeneracies in the spectrum of the Liouvillian and to how the operator is inserted in it. So if we have an operator that is dense in the energy basis and the Liouvillian whose spectrum has no degeneracies, apart from the unavoidable zero phase that I just commented, then the Grillo space dimension will be maximal. And this is the case, for example, in uh, maximal chaotic systems, because there is level repulsion and thus no degeneracies in the, in the spectrum of energies. And operators satisfy the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and thus have typically no zero elements in the energy basis. So in this case, we have saturation of the upper bound of, uh, we expect saturation of the upper bound of Krylov complexity of the dimension. And we can anticipate that degeneracies in the spectrum of the Hamiltonian or of the Liouvillian will actually reduce uh, the size of the Krylov space. But now we need to define some notion of complexity on that space. And for this, we're going to study dynamics in that space. And the first ingredient that we require for that is some orthonormal basis in Krylov space with respect to which we can measure time evolution. So this orthonormal basis is built just by taking some rearrangement of the original set of uh, consecutive powers of the Liouvillian, uh, which is going to retain some notion of ordering suitable for time evolution. Um, this is achieved by the so-called Lanxos algorithm, okay? And the idea is the following. The idea is to take as a seed for the algorithm just the initial condition. So the first element of what we will call the Krylov basis is the initial condition itself. And then at every step, we just apply the Liouvillian on the previous uh, element of the basis that we had. And we need to reorthogonalize it only with respect to the immediately previous element. And this is automatically orthogonal to all the other previous elements. Uh, that, have, that have been constructed. Now, the norm of this new element that we have uh, built 
is going to be called a Langsos uh, coefficient. And in particular, let me note here that the choice of inner product is actually important. Um, and it's apart from the initial condition of the Levillian, the inner product is the third ingredient of these uh, other units. So in this case, we're just taking uh, as inner product the, the two-point function of infinite temperature, or the Frobenius product, if you wish. Um, so finally, the output of this algorithm is just a set of orthonormal prelog elements and of Langsos coefficients, uh, which are the orthonormalization coefficients that are on the way. The property of each of the Krilov elements is that they are still uh, suitably ordered for time evolution, because the first Krilov element only contains one power up to one power of the Levillian, the second Krilov element contains up to two powers of the Levillian, and so on. So they are still probed successively in time evolution, uh, as we could see from the Taylor expansion of the time evolving operator. Um, once we have the Krilov basis, and just by looking at uh, the form of the Langsos algorithm, we can predict that the Liouvillian, in terms of the Krilov basis, takes a tree diagonal form. And this is actually important for dynamics, because this, mean, this, this is going to have some implications, as we'll discuss. Um, the idea now is to expand the operator in terms of the Krilov basis, so just a linear combination with some coordinates that we will call operator wave function. And here is where we define Krilov, com Krilov complexity. So this is just a notion of the expectation value of position with respect to this basis that we've built. And likewise, we can, uh, we can construct something called Krilov entropy, which is the Shannon entropy of this uh, operator wave packet. Um, so basically, what we have is the following thing. We have some sort of chain that we will call the Krilov chain, where localized states are the Krilov elements that we constructed. And because of the tree diagonal form of the Liouvillian, um, we just notice that the <laughs> Hobbing amplitudes are given by the Langsos coefficients that we constructed uh, in the Langsos algorithm. So this, is, this, this, redu this reduces the time evolution of the operator to a sort of uh, tight banding uh, Hopping model in, in one dimensions, where the differential equation that gives the evolution of, uh, of the wave function is a Schrodinger-like differential equation. Uh, where, as I said, uh, Langsos coefficients appear as hopping amplitudes. Um, the initial condition in particular for time evolution is just going to be a localized state at the first Krilov element, because by construction the first Krilov element is just the initial condition itself. So, from now on, I will, um, I will review the phenomenology of the behavior of Krilov complexity, starting from the thermodynamic limit, and going all the way down to finite size and to late time uh, behavior. For this, I first need to present a useful tool, which is a relation to another quantity, which is the two-point function, uh, which will be exploited in particular in studying the thermodynamic limit. Um, so the two-point function or autocorrelation of the, of the operator is just given by the inner product of the time evolved operator with itself. And this has a certain Taylor series where the moments are given by uh, the sandwich uh, of, the of, of the power of the Levillian by the initial condition. Um, now we can relate those moments to the, to the Langsos coefficients by doing the following trick. We saw that the Levillian was three diagonal, where the elements of those diagonals were given by the Langsos coefficients. So we can just split those diagonals into uh, some sort of creation and annihilation operator, um, whose definition I give here. And then we can use this directly to compute the moments, right? Because the expression of the moments is just going to be the sandwich by the initial state of this power of creation and annihilation operators. So if we expand this, uh, this bracket, we are going to get sums of monomials of A's and A daggers, uh, which are sandwiched by the, same, uh, by the same element, which is the element that is annihilated by the, the, by, by the latter operator, by the annihilation operator. Um, so this connects nicely to dick paths, um, which, is, uh, which is a combinatorial object that consists on mountain ranges, basically. So uh, paths that go up and down in a way that they never go below uh, uh, the, the, the zero level. And, and we can see this because the only monomials of A and A daggers that are going to remain non-zero after taking this expectation value are going to be monomials which contain the same number of 
creation and of annihilation operators, and which never have more annihilation operators than the previous cluster of creation operators, so that, uh, so that it never goes below O0. Right? So by using combinatorics notions related to dick paths, we can actually achieve an invertible relation between the moments of the two-point function and the Lanczos coefficients. And the strategy for studying the thermodynamic limit is to consider two-point functions, study the asymptotics of the moments, and then applying this machinery to get the asymptotics of the Lanczos coefficients. In particular, it would also be useful to note that, the, that these moments uh, can be related to the Fourier transform of the two-point function just by uh, uh, a simple integral. So, using this, um, Parker, Altman, and company uh, a few years ago uh, formulated this uh, universal operator growth hypothesis in the thermodynamic limit, uh, where they start from a known bound on the on the on the tails of the of, of the Fourier transform of the two-point function. So it is known that the two, for any uh, Q local Hamiltonian and for any uh, local operator in this Hamiltonian. Um, the, the Fourier transform of the two-point function is at most, has at most exponentially decaying tails, with some factor kappa that is governed by the geometry of the problem. Okay? So they realize that if one actually starts with a Fourier, tra with, 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 with a Fourier transform of the two-point function that has this profile, this in turn implies that along the imaginary axis, the two-point function has a singularity uh, which scales inversely with this coefficient alpha, and this in turn implies a certain asymptotics for the moments. And these asymptotics for the moments, if we plug them in the machinery uh, of dick paths, give a linear and asymptotically linearly growing uh, length of sequence. So the universal growth hypothesis that they propose is that actually in chaotic systems, uh, the length of coefficients grow as fast as they can, which is linear and with a slope that is bounded from above by uh, some geometrical factor which is system dependent. So this is the expectation for chaotic systems in the thermodynamic limit. The expectation is that they will display a linearly growing uh, length of sequence. Uh, this in turn implies maximal growth of Krilov, of Krilov complexity. Uh, intuitively, one can think of the equation that I presented before um, so, so, the, so the Schrodinger equation that governs the wave packet evolution as uh, some sort of discretized form of a wave equation. And studying the continuous limit of that equation, when, if we plug in a linearly growing profile of BNs, we see that th these BNs are like the velocity profile for that wave equation. And this would result in a, com in a complexity, which is the expectation value of position of that wave packet that grows exponentially and in entropy growing linearly. So this information is, is interesting um, for studying dynamics of chaos and actually connects to other previously known notions. And for this, we need to introduce some general framework of Q complexities of which K complexity is representative. So um, a, a Q complexity where Q stands for Kelkong, uh, this was just proposed also by Park and Alton and collaborators is a complexity defined as the expectation value in the time evolving uh, operator of some super operator Q, um, which has to verify some properties. So, so the properties are just two, and is that this operator is, has a certain spectral decomposition and is positive semi-definite. So we have uh, eigenvalues that are uh, positive or zero. So in the case of Krilov complexity, this operator Q would just be uh, the position operator on the Krilov chain. So these eigenstates would be just the Krilov elements. And these QAs, which are the eigenvalues of this uh, position operator, are just the labels of the positions of the Krilov chain. So the index, the, the, the index little n. So one, two, three, etc. cetera. Um, so these have to be understood as the complexity values associated to each of the eigenstates of the complexity superoperator Q. A further condition that one uh, needs to impose is that there exists some constant such that two things are verified. First, that the matrix element of the Liouvillian 
between two eigenstates associated to a different complexity value, two, two Q eigenstates associated to a different complexity value, is zero if these complexity values are larger than this constant. Is, yes? So the Q operator itself depends on the operator O that you are measuring because the, 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 the lattice that you defined was itself is dependent on your operator O, right? In the case of Krillov complexity, yes, because these these eigenstates are the Krillov elements that yes. depended on the on the seed of the Langs algorithm, which was the initial condition. Yes. But in general, in an arbitrary Q complexity in an element of this class, this need not be the case. I will give some examples. Okay. Um, so I was saying that one of the conditions is that uh, the matrix element of the Liouvillian between two complexity eigenstates has to be zero if their complexity is large, is, is, is too different, uh, which means that the Liouvillian should not increase arbitrarily uh, the complexity of a complexity eigenstate, mm -hmm. so that there is some kind of uh, uh, progressive buildup of complexity during time evolution. And another complexity is that the overlap of our initial condition with the comp with one a complexity eigenstate should be zero also if this complexity is too big, which 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 captures the fact that we want our initial state to have low complexity. So just by taking some super operator Q that satisfies these properties, the expectation value of this super operator in the time evolving uh, operator is going to be a notion of complexity that we call Q complexity. Um, and this definition is interesting because one, one happens to be able to prove that grill of complexity upper bounds the whole class of k-complexities, or a given of q-complexities, for a given operator O and for a given Liouvillian. So no matter what q-complexity, this is bounded from above by some constant, the constant that appeared in the definition of the q-complexity, times the grill of complexity that one would build with the same initial operator and the same Liouvillian. Um, I can give some examples, as I promised. So the first case is size complexity. So in size complexity, um, the complexity eigenstates, which I just called pi, are strings, for example, strings of poly matrices in a spin chain. And the complexity eigenvalue would be the size associated to that string. So then the spectral decomposition of the Q operator, of the size super operator, would just be the sum of each of, of the get brass of this uh, fix the size strings with the corresponding size. Um, but there's another <coughs> even more interesting uh, Q complexity, which is the autoc. So autocs out of time order correlators actually happen to fall in the category of Q complexities. Um, so by the out of time order correlator, I just mean the norm of uh, the commute of the, the norm of the commutator of some local operator V with uh, my evolving uh, operator O of t. So if we expand this expression, we see that this is actually expectation values of the form V O T V O T. So this is why we call it out of time order correlator. Um, it, it can be shown that actually the super operator uh, that so it can be shown that we can put this 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 measure in the form expectation value of some super operator where the super operator that we need is just the square of the adjoint action of the other local operator that enters in the, in the OTOC. Um, and just by taking some operator V that is also local, we can show that this satisfies the axioms of Q complexities. It's a bit cumbersome, but it's possible to be shown. And therefore, this is subject to the Q complexity upper bound. Uh, so in particular, in, max in maximally scrambling systems, we know from, for example, from works like Aldacine and Stanford, that um, at most uh, out of time order correlators grow exponentially with uh, an exponent, which is the Lyapunov exponent. So the, uh, the fact that this is bounded from above by complexity implies directly that the Lyapunov exponent is bounded by the uh, k complexity exponent alpha. Um, so this is an intriguing identity because, as, as I discussed earlier, K complexity is uniquely defined from the two point function. We can take the two point function, compute its moments. Uh, from there, we, take, we get the Langston's coefficients, and from there, we apply the machinery and get complexity. And this happens, so complexity is fully specified in terms of the two point function, 
but it also happens to bound from above information of the four-point function. So it, so it has a richer dynamical information that it might seem at first. Um, so this concludes the discussion for the thermodynamic limit. We can now try to see what happens when entropy becomes finite and we have, when we have more scope of dynamics beyond scrambling time. Um, so this was explored in paper by Barbon, Rabinovich, and collaborators. Um, and, and, and the discussion is the following. So j just as a reminder, um, in the thermodynamic limit, we computed the moments uh, of the two-point function, for example, by doing this integral uh, with the Fourier transform of the two-point function. Uh, there is a notational class, and I apologize, so because I was calling the Fourier transform phi of omega, and now it became g of omega. Um, but so the important thing is that if we take the the maximal uh, the limiting form of, of this of this uh, g of omega, which was an exponential profile, and we compute the moments of the two-point function, we get uh, an asymptotic uh, form which is factorial with n, so n to the power n. So this plug, plugging this into the machinery that uh, gives Langston's coefficients for moments, we found that this implies a linearly growing uh, sequence of Langston's coefficients. But then what happens if we actually are at finite size? So at finite size, we are considering a system of size S with some finite spectral bandwidth. So uh, it, it has a finite number of, of, of eigenstates. So um, the, the spectrum of energies cannot go all the way to infinity. And, and therefore, the energy differences have to be bounded from above by some cutoff um, that scales with some dimensional full constant lambda and uh, also linear in system size. So the bandwidth is lambda s, and this integral should be modified to have finite limits of integration between minus lambda s and plus lambda s. Um, there's an interesting discussion that one can make here, which is just trying to perform a naive subtle point approximation of this integral. So the, the saddle point contribution comes at the value of omega, which scales with little n. Okay? So if little n is sufficiently small, so very small compared to the entropy, then um, the part of the integral that gives the most contribution is very far away from the integration limits. Um, and thus, one could safely push them to infinity and uh, expect no significant change, and so the answer of the thermodynamic limit should still apply. But if n becomes comparable to the system size, then the region that contributes to the, the, the saddle point actually happens to be outside of the integration limits. And therefore, one can no longer make the approximation of pushing the integration limits to infinity, uh, and one needs to fine-grain uh, the expression. So in that case, uh, we are actually probing, starting to probe uh, discreteness of the spectrum, and we need to use the the morally correct expression of the, uh, of the moments, um, which is just a, a discrete sum uh, uh, of, of, the, uh, matrix, of the matrix elements of the operator in the energy basis uh, weighted by uh, frequencies. So it's the discrete version of, of the integral above. Um, using the ETH estimate, we can note that the off-diagonal matrix elements, which are the only ones that contribute because of this uh, factor of the energy differences, uh, are going to be given up to some prefactor by a smooth function of the energy. And thus, by considering that this function is sufficiently smooth in the range of energies that dominate this sum, we can just take this out and consider that the sum basically scales uh, like the maximal energy differences in the spectrum. So this moment scales like lambda s to the power 2n. So we have a different asymptotics for the moment. Bef before, we had that the moment grew factorially. And now, when the thermodynamic answer no longer applies, we have that the moments grow like a power law. And this, in turn, implies a Langston sequence that asymptotes to a constant, where the constant also grows uh, with, uh, with lambda s. So this is the picture that they proposed for uh, Langston's complexity, for Langston's coefficients uh, in, in, in finite uh, size systems. So some, they propose a profile that starts growing linearly, and then at some little n of order s, uh, this has to transition into a plateau. Now the question is, what happens when little n becomes, becomes of order exponential in s? So at, at, at this point, we have 
E2D has many Krylov directions and E2D has many Langsus coefficients. So we should have already explored all the, all the, all the available Krylov space and the Langsus algorithm should terminate because it cannot construct arbitrarily many orthogonal directions. So the Langsus coefficients should go to zero, but this is not seen in the asymptotic argument that I've just presented. So there's a lot of question marks about what happens there. Um, with respect to dynamics of complexity, um, we have some wave packets. So we, this is position, right? Little n is position in Krylov chain. So we have a certain wave packet that starts localized at the initial condition, and it's going to start spreading towards the right. And the Bs plays the role of some sort of uh, uh, velocity profile for this wave packet. So when the velocity profile is linear, we have an exponential growth of complexity. And when, when the velocity profile is, uh, uh, is flat, we have a linear growth of complexity. So again, we have a complexity profile that is similar to the, uh, the gravity expectation that I discussed at the beginning. Some complexity that grows uh, exponentially up to the scrambling time and then transitions to a linear growth. And this linear growth, actually, we can anticipate that for finite systems should stop at, at, at exponentially late times um, because we actually should have a finite cage because the, the size of the Krylov chain is finite. So at some point the wave packet is going to reach the edge of the chain and it's just going to become a uniform distribution of a flat wave packet whose average position would, would be just half of the, of the size of the Krylov chain. Which is half of the grid of dimension, which is itself exponential in system size. So this should be naturally bounded from above by just uh, a number that is exponential in system size. Um, so the only way to see this was to actually try to put this on a computer in a concrete system. So we studied the many body system known under the name of uh, SYK model. So this is just um, this. It, 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 this is a a set of, uh, of, of, of L sites of spinless fermions. So basically, it's Hamiltonian, with, uh, which is a sum of uh, monomials, uh, which are four site interactions, with a coupling uh, drawn from some random distribution. So this is a system which has all to all random couplings, basically. Uh, so these couplings are just Gaussian variables with zero mean and a variance that scales with some parameter j. Um, and, the, and, and, and we can just block that and analyze it and work in sectors of a fixed occupation number. So we took a certain operator, which is not extensive in system size, so it's this hopping operator, which was shown to satisfy the eigenstate normalization hypothesis in, for example, in works by Julian and his former student, Manuel Vilma. And this is the result for the Langsus coefficients in this system. So we do observe a certain initial growth and we do observe that the size of the Langsus of the Langsus sequence is actually exponential in system size, and in fact saturates the upper bound. This is because, as well again, as I said, it's a maximally chaotic system, and it has it features level repulsion. It has no exact degeneracies, and the operator that we took is dense in the energy basis. So the Krylov dimension is maximal, and we could see this by obtaining a, a maximal uh, length of the Langsus sequence. It grows initially, as I said, and then instead of plateauing, which was the naive expectation that I presented before, it decays very smoothly all the way to zero. As it should, because as I said, the algorithm has to terminate and it cannot create arbitrarily many uh, Langsus coefficients. This happens to be a non-perturbative descent, which, which, which modifies non-perturbatively the asymptotic prediction that I presented before. Because if you think of it, this grows up to a value that is roughly of order of system size, <coughs> and then decays to zero in a span that is of the order of the Krylov dimension, which is exponential in system size. So the slope is basically of order e to the minus 2s, so it's a non-perturbative correction to, a, to, a, to, the, to, the, to the proposed profile before. So this is the k-complexity profile that one obtains for this uh, type of sequence. So we can solve the differential equation for the wave packet um, uh, by inputting uh, this profile of hopping amplitudes. And the result is uh, a packet that uh, a complexity that starts growing more than linearly. We can say that it's exponentially just because it's a, a very small range. And then transitions to, some, to a somewhat linear behavior 
that at very late times saturates at a value that is very close to half of the Grillov dimension. The way back at this has become uniform. Conversely, uh, Krylov entropy also displays uh, uh, the profile that it should depict. So, um, so it just has an initial linear growth that then transitions to a very slow logarithmic growth and then saturates eventually at a value that is of order of system size. Because if the wave packet is uniform at 1 over k, then the Shannon entropy goes like log of k, which is uh, itself uh, system size. So we ma so we managed we managed to find uh, the mechanism for saturation of complexity uh, how how it is realized explicitly in in a concrete system it just consists on uh, a length of sequence that actually decays slowly to zero uh, and uh, which implies uh, a wave packet that starts propagating towards the right and eventually becomes uniform in, the, in a finite gauge. So the question now is what to expect in integrable systems. Is, is, is this different from the behavior that one would obs uh, observe in an integrable system? Um, if, if we want to back up the claim that uh, uh, k-complexity is very sensible to, uh, to, uh, to spectral statistics and to chaoticity. So we can make two discussions. We can start by considering three systems uh, where h is just going to be quadratic in, in, uh, in local operators. Uh, such as uh, SYK with two-side interactions instead of four-side interactions, or some set of oscillators. What happens there is that this type of Hamiltonian doesn't make operators grow. So uh, whatever, whatever the size of the grid of space is, it's just going to grow at most linearly with the system size, because it's going to be given by the, the subspace of operators of a fixed, uh, of fixed size and equal to the size of the initial condition. So in that case, trivially, complexity is bounded from above by something much lower than, uh, <coughs> than the upper bound that we found for SYK, which was exponentially big in system size. But then the more intriguing question is what happens in strongly interacting integrable systems. In these systems, um, th these are typically defined by, by the Bette ansatz. So uh, I understand as an integrable system, a system that can be solved in the Bette ansatz technique. Um, and this implies that these systems have many symmetries. They appear in the, in the series expansion of the transfer matrix. And, and by many, I mean extensively many conserved charges. This implies that there is going to be a high level of uncorrelation between the eigenvalues of, of, of the Hamiltonian. And therefore, the, the level spacing statistics become Poissonian. Um, so it is very likely to find eigenvalues arbitrarily close to each other. But, however, this doesn't necessarily imply that they're going to be degenerate. So, and in fact, as we will see, there are in gen gener generically there are no exact degeneracies in the spectrum of these systems. And furthermore, as we will also see, operators need not be dense, can, can be dense in the energy basis. So they will not satisfy the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, but still all their elements in the energy basis can be non-zero. So we have, the, we have that the two ingredients that grant saturation of the Grillov dimension are satisfied. And, th and thus, one would expect that in strongly interacting integral systems, the grill of space is also maximal. And it seems that this is no different from what we saw in chaotic systems. However, the difference here is going to arise at the dynamical level. Um, uh, so how is this grill of space actually explored in this case? For this, we notice that the Langston's coefficients have a slightly different uh, behavior. Uh, they become erratic. And this is, and this is because of the following. So, I mentioned earlier that there is a bijective relation between the moments of the two-point function and the Langston's coefficients. So uh, if we want to go from moments to Langston's coefficients, this is actually the form that the relation takes. So each Langston's coefficient bn is given by some ratio of uh, Hankel determinants, which is, somewhere, which is a determinant of a matrix constructed by uh, moments up to the nth moment uh, arranged in a particular way. So these Hankel determinants can be related to van der Monde matrices of subset of faces uh, of, of, the, of, the end fa of, of groups of little n faces for the nth Hankel determinant. Um, and, and as a reminder, I would say that the, the determinant of, uh, of the van der Monde matrices is given by product of the differences of the ratio of the ratios that define the geometric progressions 
of the covalence of the matrix. So what occurs here is that because of the Poissonian statistics, we're going to have many phases that are arbitrarily close to each other. So many of these Hankel of these van der Monde determinants can become close to zero whenever the phases are close to each other, and therefore the Hankel determinant itself can also become small. So we have an expression for Langsos coefficients which involves ratios of quantities that can become arbitrarily small, and furthermore, when a, for if, if for the Langsos coefficient uh, bn we find some Hankel determinant in the denominator, for the next analysis coefficient, bn plus 1, this Hankel determinant will appear in the numerator. So there is some alternating uh, structure that is going to cause also erraticness uh, of the sequence. Um, and just recalling that the Langsos coefficients are the hopping amplitudes in this uh, one-dimensional effective quantum mechanical problem on the Krylov chain, we realize that the disorder of these Langsos coefficients due to the presence of quasi-degeneracies in the spectrum uh, grants some form of localization in the Anderson sense. So the propagation of the wave packet is going to be hindered by the, by the existence of some disorder in the Langsos coefficients. So the Krylov chain can be maximal, but the propagation of the wave packet is slowed down just by the effect of, uh, of the disorder of the, of, of the Langsos coefficients. So how can we probe this? So we wish to compute k complexity as a function of time, and we, we are going to observe that it actually doesn't grow all the way to the maximal value that it would obtain if, if the Liouvillian generating time evolution would be that of a chaotic system. Uh, and we can also predict that from spectral quantities by considering the expression of the long time uh, average of, of k-complexity. So k-complexity is the expectation value of position of the operator wave packet, and for the long time average of complexity, we need to compute the long time average of the amplitude square of the wave packet. So this is just given, so, so, so the amplitude square is just given, as one can see, just by introducing some resolutions of the identity, by an oscillating phase weighted by overlaps of, uh, of Krylov elements and uh, Liouvillian eigenstates. And if we time average, we basically kill the oscillating phase and get only the diagonal terms. So this takes an interesting form, which we call transition probability, because it can be interpreted in the following way. So we have that um, the wave, the probability, so the wave packet squared, which is the probability at site n, is a combination of the probabilities of the initial condition. Um, let's see. It, yeah, it, it, it's basically the overlap of the, between the initial condition and the eigenstate i, and then the overlap between that eigenstate i and uh, the, 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 the final localized state n. So it's basically the transition probability between the initial condition and the, uh, and the position n mediated by all possible uh, uh, intermediary states that are the, the, the Abelian eigenstates. So that's why we call this a transition probability. And finally, uh, the, the long time average of, of complexity is just given by uh, the expectation value of position that one gets from the form of this transition probability. So it's the, it's the site of Krylov chain that is most likely to be reached uh, uh, on average. Uh, and we prove this now with uh, a case of strongly interacting uh, uh, system, which is the XXC spin chain. So this is just a, a chain of, of n spins. Uh, with nearest neighbor interactions, just given by uh, in, uh, uh, monomials of, of poly matrices, where there is uh, one coupling strength in the z direction that singles out the z direction from the xy plane. Uh, this system is known to be solvable via beta ansatz and has, therefore, an extensive number of conserved sure. charges. And we, in particular, can work in, in, in sectors of the Hilbert space with fixed magnetization and fixed parity, and sometimes even a fixed uh, charge conjugation. Um, so the presence of this number of symmetries en ensures um, that the system has Poisson, uh, Poisson statistics, um, but there are still no exact degeneracies, as we will see. And we can take uh, a sector preserving local operator, which is just some uh, poly matrix on, on a given site plus its parity con uh, conjugate, so that 
we remain in the same uh, parity sector. And we can observe numerically that this is dense in the energy basis. And uh, just for reference, I can give the histogram of energy differences, which is a nice illustration of the discussions I've been making. So the reddish colors are instances of SYK. So this is uh, horizontal axis gives uh, the difference between consecutive eigenvalues in the spectrum, right? So for, for the instances of SYK, which is a maximally chaotic system, um, we find that below the mean level spacing, because this axis is normalized by the mean level spacing, the probability of finding uh, two eigenstates close to each other is actually, is two eigenvalues close to each other actually decreases. Conversely, the, the bluish colors are XXC instances where actually the probability grows below the mean level spacing because this is just a Poissonian curve that reflects the lack of correlation between the eigenvalues. Um, and we can go on and compute the Langstroth coefficients. So the form of the Langstroth coefficients that we obtain in various instances of XXC are actually very similar to what we saw in SYK. So it's just some initial growth and then an, a very slow non-perturbative decay towards zero and the size of the Krilov space is exponential in system size because there are no exact degeneracies and because the operator is dense in the energy basis. So the only difference is that the sequence behaves a bit more erratically as it decays. So in particular, we can measure the disorder of, uh, of, of, of these Langstroth uh, coefficients and this is what I depict here. So horizontal axis is just the size of the Krilov chain K and the vertical axis is the standard deviation of the, of the Langstroth coefficients. Um, we see that for, for comparable system sizes, reddish colors, which are SYK, have lower value of disorder strength than the, the bluish colors, which are uh, XXC. So it, it's indeed true that the disorder is a bit, it's a bit stronger in the, in the Langstroth coefficients of XXC. And uh, if we compute K complexity, we do observe an effect of uh, some sort of effect of localization. So th the value at which we expected complexity to saturate for, uh, for chaotic systems like SYK is depicted here in an, as a horizontal red line. It's K over 2. It's half of the, uh, of the grid of size, of the grid of chain size. And we see that complexity actually grows but saturates at some finite fraction that is lower than that, uh, than that saturation value. So indeed, propagation of the packet has been hindered in a way. And here on the right, just to be more illustrative, I give the transition probabilities uh, that I was discussing before. Um, so in red, you see several cases of SYK where the transition probability happens, happens to be flat. So this means that the long time average uh, of the wave packet is, is, is something that is a flat a uniform distribution in, in Krilov space. So therefore, from this one, would predict that the grid of dimension, the grid of complexity, saturates at a value which is k over two, as we observed uh, in, pre in the previous numerics. For XXC, however, we see that it has a slight tilt. So the long time average transition probability is actually a bit lower for sites at the end of the chain and a bit higher for sites at the beginning of the chain. So therefore, it's biased towards the left and the expectation value position, which I depict with a vertical line, is actually smaller than, than k over 2, which is what we actually observed by computing uh, the dynamical evolution of complexity. So this was uh, a concrete demonstration that uh, in an integrable system, despite having a maximally big Krilov space, um, complexity is not able to grow as, effect as efficiently as in a chaotic system. Um, so now I can give some concluding remarks. So k-complexity is a notion of complexity that um, does not require an external tolerance parameter and we've been interested in defining it, in studying it for this reason and because of the fact that it just naturally suited to the time evolution of some initial condition with some new billion and no other ingredients. So it has a certain phenomenology at late times that I have uh, reviewed. For chaotic systems, it saturates at an exponentially large value at exponentially large time scales. For strongly interacting integrable systems, which is a step below um, it has a suppressed saturation value due to localization effects in the Krilov chain and for free systems it's just saturated by a very small value which is going to be linear in system size. So apart from the perhaps attractive feature of not having a tolerance parameter, it's a quantity that is interesting maybe in other respects different from holography because it probes, it seems to be able to probe chaotic behavior 
uh, at least for at finite size mm -hmm. to a relatively good extent. There are some other upfront questions that are uh, still uh, under investigation, such as uh, understanding more concretely the origin of the disorder of the Lanxos coefficients, and in particular we are still not able to predict how it scales with system size analytically. And we would also like to get some extensions of this notion. So for example, uh, how we scale complexity for time-dependent Hamiltonians, and eventually once we have a compendium of all its properties, we would also like to ask what is the concrete bulk realization of this quantity. Um, so with this I will conclude. Thank you.